So let's start with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for your amazing grace and mercy to us. Thank you for the promises that give us such hope for what you can and will do as we turn our lives, our will, over to you and let you give it back to us, we're told, formed in your own image, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. So the topic is natural remedies and medical evangelism. And there, I don't know how many, of you, how many of you see a contradiction or a contrast there. Just that title, natural remedies and medical evangelism. Many people see a contradiction or or something because uh, natural remedies are not medical or medical is what licensed people do all right doctors nurses etc so I wanted to just share a little bit uh, of a prelude to this because I well maybe I don't know why but maybe because I uh, I feel like that medical evangelism uh, which is not done only by licensed clinicians. Uh, most of it is going to be done by lay people and, and is being done probably by lay people. But I wanted to share a couple of principles I think are so important. So as my outline here, and again, this was not intended as a handout. I have one that's in a little different format to take notes on, but I didn't, uh, that's not been printed. Uh, is that evangelism of any kind is not about the evangelist. It's not about the, orga the church or the organization that, that does it. It's about Christ. It's about the gospel. And sometimes we, in our uh, efforts to do these, to do evangelism, medical evangelism, health evangelism, whatever you want to call it, we have a tendency to uh, focus on the presenter, the, the team, the people who are doing it. Uh, and it's, and I can understand that because I know one of the common things that is said, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, some of the evangelism we've been doing in Grand Rapids uh, in the presentation a little bit later. But when the health guests, as we call them, or the participants in the program, the Lifestyle Change Program, they almost always talk about how they felt loved. I just, I'm, I remember some people that came, uh, we did two in Grand Rapids recently, one in September, one in October. And the, a number of the people that were in the September program uh, were not Seventh-day Adventists. They weren't church members. They were coming occasionally to Sabbath school. They weren't, um, English was a second language for them. And they made it, they, they kind of surprised me, uh, maybe even startled me by uh, what they said was, we, don't, we have been in this country a number of years, and this is the first Caucasian people we've gotten to know that we, that, that we feel like we know them and they love us. Now, I didn't take that, I, didn't, I, didn't, I don't know how one should take it, but I didn't take it as a, as a criticism. I didn't take it as though anybody had done anything wrong. After all, even in our, uh, at our fellowship meal, or at our, uh, um, not a fellowship meal, but at our, our meal for the treatment program, the ones that spoke the same language tended to sit in the same place because they can talk to each other. I get it. Uh, and, I, and I didn't understand uh, their language. And uh, I did sit at their table a time or two, and they spoke some broken English. But the point is, language does separate us, and that's not a sin. I, if I'm not mistaken, that was done by God, right, at the, at the Tower of Babel, I think, is when we ended up with different languages, and I don't believe, uh, so I, I, maybe I'm radical compared to what some of you are thinking, but I don't think it's wrong that I tend to associate more with people I can talk to. And I'm not surprised when they associate with people they can talk to. But what was so neat was, even though there was this language difference, the program produced a sense of, of fellowship and, and comradeship that they literally said, we've, we've never had this. You're the, this is the only um, Caucasian group. I don't remember what word. They don't, I don't know. They may have said Caucasian. But um, anyway, it also helped me realize that I do need to reach out 
like in church or wherever, to people that are not my natural, you know? I, I, and so, anyway, it was good. I mean, overall, it was good. They, I mean, it was a good thing they said, right? And we didn't, we didn't work at that. We, we, you know what I mean? We didn't like have a little confab and say, well, we need to make sure we reach out to the ones that can't speak English. We, didn't, we just were treating everybody with uh, the same kind of love and treatment. What they were impressed with was because we were using uh, hydrotherapy treatments and we were using chair massage and we were using poultices uh, and uh, not a few people hardly ever have anyone touch them except a family member. And, and you know, in our modern lifestyle, there's not a lot of touch. And, and on the one hand, you can almost understand it. I don't know, maybe you're familiar with this, but uh, male, adult males have reason to avoid being alone with a child or a woman that they are, are not a relative. Even, you, can, you can't even get in trouble if a child accuses you of something. You are guilty until you can prove yourself innocent. And so as physicians, for example, we would never see a, uh, a patient of that type without someone else present unless there was you know, some compelling. Anyway, my point is, I'm just trying to point out, in our modern society, there is a lot of reasons why some people don't want to be touching or even uh, uh, in a place where they could be accused of having done something wrong. You're, you're acquainted with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I'm not saying that it's not reasonable. There's, some, there's bad things happening. So I don't know what the answer is. Oh uh, well, the answer is that we're going to put an end to the sin experience soon. I don't know just how soon, but it's going to end well. Uh, we are going to be rid of all that kind of stuff. Well, anyway, so uh, they loved, they, they, most people tend to think about when they have this uh, testimony at the, at the graduation, they tend to think about, oh my, my blood work is so much better, my risk factors are, are so much lower. And I certainly, as a physician, I look at that. But what I find so interesting is that they talk about the people that they had, uh, had shown them love. But anyway, I just think that uh, this first point I'm wanting to make here is that uh, the, the tendency is to glorify man to glorify nature, to glorify that instead of, so that's why I think we have to be especially vigilant about um, bringing glory to Christ, glory to God, glory to uh, the gospel, and not to uh, each, uh, individuals, and not even to the, the treatments. That's one of the things about, about uh, natural remedies is there, we can tend to use them or think of them like an alternative to a medicine. But that, I think, is wrong. It's not an alternative to a medicine. A medicine is a, uh, well, pharmakia is the Greek term, but anyway, it's, it's like an uh, antidote to the problem. Well. Natural remedies, uh, I'm going to show you the, the reasons why, the, the basis for why we use them. And, and while they are physiologic, it's not, that's, that's not the primary reason that we use it. Uh, I want to point out something else here. So this second point is about Satan. Um, Satan is called the prince of the power of the air and the prince of this world. And uh, there's the, in Ephesians and in John, um, so, if there's any doubt about this, uh, think about the uh, story in Job, where right the sons of God came together to meet, and uh, and God apparently sort of put Job, um, Satan to the test. Says, "Have you seen my servant Job?" Right? I always find this dialogue interesting because it was God that sort of started this little thing that they had. And, uh, but he didn't really start it. If you really think about it, Lucifer started it when he accused God in heaven. And so this is a continuation of that, right? You, we all understand as, um, that there's a great controversy going on and the issue is still very active. Uh, it's not been settled uh, yet. 
And uh, I know we have the prophecy, we know how it ends, but the events are still transpiring. So anyway, and uh, there I was quoted in Job 1, 13 to 22, and uh, 2, verse 7, and what those refer to is where as soon as God said, okay, he's in your hands, just spare his life. Uh, that was in chapter 2, chapter 1, right? He said uh, not to touch him personally. So the point is, think about it for a moment. The only limitation on Satan's power that we are aware of is God's hedge. God tells Lucifer, Satan, thus far and no further. All right, well, let's follow that logically a little bit further along. So, to uh, see there, he's, he's got great latitude to work out. He's being given great latitude to work out his designs uh, in order to reveal uh, the true nature of, of his assertions. So he says, God is arbitrary and unfair, and you have to watch out for yourself. You, we each need to be taking care of our own interest. Basically, that was Lucifer's charge. So God has given Lucifer a great deal of latitude so that the whole universe looking on will have no question that Lucifer's approach is faulty. It is not valid. It's not something you want to do. And I'm just amazed personally. I mean, uh, I was converted in my 20s, and so I was an adult. And I, I was astounded to, to learn about the condescension of God. I thought, what, what an amazing creator that would give us this kind of latitude. You, you realize he's basically put himself on trial. Let us be the jury and the, and the judge of his character. Now, I realize he's still the omnipotent judge of, the, of all things, but he submitted himself to my uh, judgment. In fact, that's, um, I was impressed that God gave me the choice to kill my creator. I mean, I didn't personally do it, but he gave us as men, mankind, obviously, the ability and the opportunity, and we, and we did it. We killed him. And I know none of you in this room did that. I'm not at all convinced that if we had been alive, or if I'd been alive when Christ was living, that I would not have been part of that crowd. I can't prove to you that I wouldn't have been. Uh, there were some mighty uh, religious people there. So, Satan has tremendous power. That's important for us to, to, when we talk about these natural remedies, because if I were to ask you, what is one of the biggest impediments in, in the church or the people that we know um, to using natural remedies? What, what is, what are, give me a couple. What are some of the reasons that we don't see more of it or we don't do more of it? Credentials. Credentials is a, is a great thought, absolutely. Um, and so that makes us a little afraid, right? In the church, certainly, the risk management people seem to be extremely afraid of it. Uh, because of the litigious society. But what does Ellen White, do you know one that, what she says is one of the main reasons that we don't see more of it? It's because it takes work, which many are unwilling to do. And I can tell you, as one who runs programs that uses this a lot, it's a lot of work. It is. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, doing things naturally tends to take longer than just to take a medicine. Yeah, it's slower. I have two girls, and we do things naturally when they get sick. And so it takes a little bit longer, and it takes more effort than just giving them some medicine. And, and it, it's a labor of love, and yeah. afterwards, we're like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Yes. We got through this. Well, you're absolutely right. And she also mentions that as one of the things, that they want a more uh, quick uh, solution yeah. than natural remedies. They, t they do seem to take longer. Yeah. Um, and, of course, the length of time they take, another, while we're on that point, is the longer I wait to start, the longer it takes for them to accomplish our goal. So if I, if I don't start, if, or I can't, let's suppose I'm traveling, I've had this happen, I've been, I'm traveling and I'm out of my country, I'm, uh, I've been on the plane, whatever, and, and I start feeling like I'm gonna get a sore throat or something's happening to my uh, pharynx. The longer it takes me to get 
a treatment started, the more likely I'm going to have a worse case of it and take longer to get rid of it. Uh, so the point uh, here is, uh, and number two there, is that um, Satan has power to work miracles, what we would call miracles. I don't know if you've ever, again, I'm, I'm being a little cerebral here, but uh, I'm doing that primarily to prove some of these points that are, or to attempt to, to prove some of these points that are sometimes contested. So, so as I understand a miracle, a miracle is essentially something that would not occur naturally. It would not, you would not expect to be able to do some, something with a, uh, in the physical world that would produce that event. Uh, so, and I, I call those raw miracles, okay, because the, we have a statement in the Spirit of Prophecy that not all of Christ's miracles appear as miracles, but they are the result of what seem to be natural uh, course of events. And that's where the natural remedies come in. Okay, so we know that Satan's purpose is to get the whole world under his uh, control. Um, and he is, we're told, he will be working counterfeit miracles, especially in the end. In fact, as she says, as God's spirit is withdrawn from the earth, Satan's power to work miracles is greater. So we may have already seen some amazing uh, miracles from Satan. There's certainly plenty of them documented in the Gospels. And we, but we, you might say, haven't seen anything yet. Okay, we're going to see uh, remarkable things. Remember, we're, we're told that we will not even be able to believe our eyes that are in our senses. Uh, and recently I've been thinking about that and thinking about uh, so-called artificial intelligence. We're already now to the point that you cannot believe what you see in a, a digital form. Uh, I believe what that scripture, I mean that passage from Ellen White is saying though, is we're going to get to the point in the world where we cannot believe what we're watching right in front of us. We, we see it not digital. Okay, if it's digital already you can't be guaranteed that that's real. Uh, but we're going to get to the point apparently where we're not going to be able to believe what is happening right in front of us. Uh, and we're told that we have to test it by the scriptures. What is its influence? Is it uh, a right influence or wrong to know? So why am I telling you all this? Because, uh, because it's important, that D right there, it is imperative for God to maintain a, a clear distinction between his work and Satan's. Uh, and he has a way prepared to do that. Okay, and I'm going to show you then here. Uh, basically, that's why and where sanitarium work came about. Was sanitarium work was established by God as an al an alternative to quote raw miracles, as someone said in the class this morning. And these two are related. They're not. They stand alone, but but they're related topics. Um, that is that at the end, at the very end, there will be raw miracles happening amongst God's people and amongst the, the fake, the counterfeit, both. And so, uh, but, but now during the, the time of the three angels' message and the loud cry, we are not, we're told we cannot rely on these raw miracles. So God has established the sanitarium work, which is to be used using natural means according to God's will. Second, uh, second selected message is 346. I think I quoted here somewhere. Uh, if, well, if 54. Second selected message is 54. Uh, paragraphs 2, and 3, and 4. Talk about the way that Christ worked and then says that Satan will be working miracles so we cannot work in that manner. For this reason, Christ has marked out a way for us to carry forward a work of physical healing combined with the teaching of the word. And he, she says sanitariums are to be established. So um, the other thing I want to share is that one of the, you mentioned credentials. I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Marvin. Marvin. had mentioned credentials. And this is an issue for sure, especially if you uh, remember the testimony that we heard from Dr. Uh, Che, is that how she says her name, Che? I, I always want to call it Cho. But anyway, the doctor who got up and shared about the Lucas, the little boy, uh, during the plenary, um, what did she say that she and Mercy um, felt when they were 
treating him with unconventional methods, she was afraid. And uh, I appreciate her straightforward. I, 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 uh, I can understand that fear. I have felt that fear myself. Uh, you know, it tends to decrease with age because after, the older you get, some of you older ones here can see if you agree with me, but the older I get, the less it, it, it scares me. I mean, it's like they've done everything else to me. What, are, what new are they going to do? Uh, and the Lord is taking care of me, so. But anyway, uh, so lifestyle medicine is now a recognized uh, medical uh, specialty. You can get board certified as a physician in lifestyle medicine. Now, it's not to the point of being certified like as family practice or in surgery. It's more like being certified in sports medicine or obesity medicine. These are like subspecialties, okay? But uh, the fact that that's true has done something very uh, useful for us in this arena, and that is now a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA can get certified in lifestyle medicine and you can, and it reduces greatly this stigma of using these unconventional approaches because it's proven uh, uh, science. It's, it's evidence-based medicine. In fact, um, lifestyle medicine is fastest growing area of medicine, not just in the United States, but in the world because it is, it is the only way to address chronic disease that really removes the cause. And what we found is we simply cannot afford the cost of treating the symptoms alone for chronic disease. It's just too rampant and, and we can't afford it, can't happen. So lifestyle medicine gives us an opportunity for medical evangelists to use God's simple methods. Uh, the one I use is the acronym is Start Anew. And in fact, we have a website that works perfectly, startanew.me, and I'll show you that in just a minute. Uh, got to make sure I don't take too long on these so-called preliminary points. But I'll put this over here. So let me skip on ahead here a little bit. I'm going to talk to you about the uh, programs that we're doing. And so it looks like in my notes, that's, now's the time to do that. Okay. And then we're going to cover a couple of points at the end. So let me now go to my slides. And I have a slide uh, program here I want to show. So I, I gave this just a few days ago at the Lansing Seventh-day Adventist Church, but I think you'll easily catch the connection. Yeah, and I, so I give this talk at a lot of different kind of audiences, and some of them it's very important for me to acknowledge what my conflicts of interest might be. The only thing that I have to advocate here that relates to me personally is the Start New Me program, uh, but it is a nonprofit and it is a uh, a medical ministry program in Grand Rapids. Yeah, so it's, uh, you'll recognize these, sunshine, trust in God, air, rest, temperance, abstinence, nutrition, exercise, water, and you. So uh, my wife Sally and I, as you've heard, uh, we've been around a while, and uh, so we were engaged at Weimar in 1979, and uh, while we were there, uh, the New START acronym first uh, came about. It was Ernie Baxter was one of the health guests, and he's the one that won the contest they had on the campus for a acronym for these natural remedies in Ministry of Healing, page 127. Well, Ernie is a really smart guy, and he, I love that acronym, but he had to do one thing to make it work, and that was he had to change where she says, on page 127, she says, abstemiousness, and uh, he transformed that into temperance. So by using temperance, he could have nutrition, exercise, water, sunshine, temperance, air, rest, and trust in divine power. It was a beautiful acronym. But nowadays, uh, intermittent fasting and fasting mimicking diet and all kinds of, of uh, abstemiousness is, is well known. And so I thought, well, we need to get that back in there uh, because we were ahead of the times. So we put the A, for abstemiousness in, and, um, and then we changed it to abstinence because most people don't even know what abstemiousness is in our day. <laughs> and I mean that literally, but it's also kind of funny. Uh, I mean, we don't know what abst abstemiousness is. We, we know what uh, overabundance is, 
right? I mean, we're, our biggest problem with diet in our country is we eat too much, frankly, not that we eat too little. Anyway, so, and then I found the, the um, uh, suffix, uh, whatever, web, uh, is, dot me is, is pretty common these days, so it worked perfectly. I thought, new, start a new dot me. Start a new dot me. So it's basically uh, like new start. In fact, I, uh, being an acquaintance and a friend of Nedley, I contacted him to see if, if Weimar uh, would have any concern about this uh, infringing on new start. And, and we discussed it and talked to it, and, and there's no problem. We are, we're good. And uh, so, well, so now I'm a data guy. I'm, I'm a, trained as an epidemiologist as well as as a physician. Uh, and I have a, a computing background. So if there's too much information on here for you to worry about, OK, unless you are uh, a statistician type person, because I've got p-values and, and sample size and all that. But the bottom line is the colors. If you look at this graph, you'll see that there's three columns for every measure that, we, that we've tracked, OK? And they're listed across, OK? And there's, each column is a different. So this is all people, all 21 people. This was their beginning blood, uh, I'm sorry, weight, and their ending weight, OK? And the color makes it really easy. This, this gray hash mark is the drop, how much it went down. The, the orange in the middle is those that were at high risk. And so right here, there was 12 people that had a BMI great, equal to or greater than 30. And so they're in this here. They were average blood, I mean, weight was 235, and their average ending was 226. So they went down by the amount of gray. The red is the one person that had the largest percent risk reduction. So the one that lost the greatest percent of their weight, not the one that was necessarily the heaviest, but the one that lost the greatest percent, 253 went to 236. OK, well, that's not, I mean, weight doesn't change that fast. In fact, if we had a change like this in weight in uh, how many days? 16 days, person would probably be in the hospital, OK? You can't lose 2 thirds of your weight in 16 days and survive, most likely. OK, so, so this is not unusual. But as you start looking at other things, blood pressure, cholesterol, triglycerides, and so forth, all this stuff across here, now, here's one that, by the way, that is green, right? That's because the quality of life score is better, higher. So this is a 100. The ideal quality of life score for SF36 is 100 points. And so you can see the worst person that is, no, the one who had the greatest percent improvement started at 28 and went to 77. 75 is considered the, the cutoff point, OK? So, uh, Remarkable. I mean, there's a lot of gray showing there. This, this is unbelievable to me. Um, look at here. This just so happens I know uh, who these people are in the red. Uh, and this is the same person. This one and this one, same person. This person had a 271 point drop in triglycerides and dropped into to the middle of, or of the good range. And also had 160, what, three, I think it was, uh, 60 something drop um, in their blood sugar, which was ended in the good range. Um, I, it, what doesn't show on here, oh, well, the quality of life, I don't know if this, I don't know if that was her, I don't believe that was her, but I can tell you this that whereas she was waking up three and four times a night because of pain in her legs, from neuropathy, and, and she was having um, what well, she, could, she couldn't drive anymore because her feet were numb enough she couldn't really tell, you know, pushing on the pedal. She, it wasn't safe for her to drive. And she had poor balance because she didn't, you know, one of the, when you start losing uh, proprioception, you don't really know where your legs are and you stumble on stuff. And so she had a walker. And she was starting to lose sensation in her fingertips. I mean, no, I, I just, I, I'm so thankful. I don't know what that's like, but I can imagine it must really, really scare you. It must really make you dread what's happening to you. So she went, through the, she went into the program. She was, I don't remember the person's age, but somewhere between 65 and 75. I'm not sure exactly where. And when she, by the time she, before she finished, she was already having 
uh, freedom from neuropathy. She started sleeping all night with being awakened. Uh, her husband even commented on the, one of the things. He says she's not grumpy as she used to be. And uh, <laughs> she started driving. She got rid of her four-footed cane. She started, I saw her, she was coming to our home. We, in this situation, now I'm going to show you the schedule. It was a 16-day program. I want to show you how we did it. But we were, wanted them to have the meals. The food is so important. So we were taking the food to them on the weekdays uh, at lunch. And uh, because I wanted them to have the food ready to eat and, and enjoyable. And she was close enough, she came to the house to get the meals. And so I could see her almost every day. And you could just see, I wish I'd have been smart enough to take some pictures, but you could see the difference happening in front of your eyes. And especially when I saw her walk up the two or three steps the, up to our stoop to the door, and she didn't hang on to the, to the uh, post and so forth like she had been doing to stabilize herself. Anyways, she, oh, she just said, uh, three days ago, I think it was, she said, uh, I think I'm going to throw away my handicapped parking uh, slip permit. I was, I thought about it, but I, I wonder, I haven't decided what to do. I thought about it immediately saying, well, you don't have to throw it away to stop using it, you know, in case. But I thought, no, that's, that's, that's not faith. That's, that, that might discourage her, and I don't want to discourage her because she is making tremendous progress. She's lost some 20-some pounds, not a whole lot. Uh, see, this is just in 16 days. The marvelous thing, as you know, I, I hope you know, is that it keeps on going. So we're, uh, well, let me get it here, see where we are. Oops, I don't want to do that yet. Go back here. All right. Um, I, apparently, the slide I was thinking was next is further down. But... How, uh, what I wanted to share was that the program is a 16-day jumpstart or launch. We launch the program with a 16-day intensive intervention. But it is actually a every week meeting for three months with people, various people from the team, so that they are always connected. In other words, we provide ongoing support. It's an alumni group, and they're encouraged to invite anyone who they told what happened to them and they said, wow, I'd like to know more about it. Tell them to come with you to the alumni meeting and every alumni meeting they bring taste samples only, okay? Don't bring a meal. Don't, don't, we don't, because people, in fact, somebody, people were bringing too much and, and, the, and the other alumni were, um, were wanting to be kind so they came to us instead of to them and said, you know, we don't eat supper anymore, and we really don't want to have a, um, a meal at the, as part of this because we feel like we need to eat, you know, to be kind to everybody or whatever. But, but we've been having such success because we put them onto a two-meal-a-day plan as part of it's called early time-restricted feeding is the scientific term, uh, early time-restricted feeding. We Adventists would know it as the two-meal-a-day plan. But anyways, and uh, so... We, we told them, well, that's right. We'll remind them, you're supposed to only bring taste samples. And, uh, and so, and it's got to be made out of a recipe in the cookbook that we supply. And uh, so anyway, that's what's happening. Um, I'm missing a meeting as of last night. I missed that one. I will uh, be there the next time. I'm excited about doing it. It is so fun to see what is continuing to happen to these people. Now, why is that a, a neat for medical evangelism? Because the way the most successful evangelism works, and that we have data to show this in the church, is that when f church members befriend people in the community and they they come to the church for whatever we're doing, whether it's a small group activity or a Sabbath school or, a bo uh, well, I started to say Boy Scouts because I was, wasn't raised Adventist and I was in the Boy Scouts, but if I'd been Adventist, I would have been in the Pathfinders, Pathfinders. or whatever, what's the younger one called? Adventurers. Adventurers? Yeah, Adventurers. I think those are great programs. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, I organized the Boy Scout troop in my grade school with my dad's help, and so I'm, a, I'm really in, I think that's a great part of being a child. Anyways, so we are having now, just think about this in terms of evangelism. 
we are having regularly people, members and non-members, who are coming to a group activity once a week, talking about healthful living, sharing stories at the church, and any church member is welcome to, to come and get to know these people. Duh. We're doing, we made evangelism, we brought it right to you. We, we, and so that's the right arm, okay? To me, that's an example of the right arm. We are helping people with their felt needs, serious health conditions that many of their doctors have no, and let me tell you, as a physician, we do not have an, quote, accepted treatment to reverse neuro, diabetic neuropathy and numbness of your limbs and uh, we'll treat symptoms as best we're able, but we don't have a treatment for that. And so, um, in fact, already two of the people, their physician or their cardiologist or endocrinologist has asked for information <laughs> about, about this Dr. Kelly, whoever he is, and what training does he have? Because they are saying, we haven't, you know, well, they didn't say this to them, but I know what they're saying because I've trained doctors and I know what they said. And they says, how, how does this happen? How does this happen? They have, this shouldn't happen. So now what is it if it shouldn't happen, but it's happening? The, you cannot convince those health guests it was not a miracle. They believe it is a miracle. Now, I admit that I pray for miracles. I, I ask them, is it okay with you if, if I ask God to do a miracle for you in this program? And they've never sent about, somebody said, no, no, don't do that. Of course, they're happy to have that. And I don't have to have their faith in the miracle for it to happen. We're told we take them in our faith, in the arms of our faith. And I tell them, God has done amazing things many times for me. I don't know what he will do for you. For example, I would not have told this lady, oh, we have a cure for your neuropathy. Listen, I tremble at some of the things that they come with. <laughs> Lord, please help us. I don't know what to do for this. We're going to just do your instructions. We're going to follow the instructions as best we know how, and we're going to ask for miracles. And all I can tell you is it happens. Amazing things happen. I, I, maybe, maybe that is what I should do. I'm just impressed to tell you another story. I may not get through all my slides. I've got to tell you this one. It illustrates, and this will happen to you. And you don't have to be a doctor to do this. In fact, being a doctor can be a detriment to doing this for the very reason you mentioned. All right? If, if I'm concerned that the medical community will get upset with me, they can take my license. They can, they can cause the medical society to, to come after me, etc. Okay? I don't know if they could put me in jail if I, did, if I didn't do anything harmful, but they can certainly change my life as a physician. So there's reason to be concerned. But here's the nice thing. We're making this so that there's nothing medical that is being done by the church members. Nothing medical, okay? All the medical is being done by volunteer clinicians, licensed clinicians, and is done in a way that is not, it's not part of the main program, okay? So we screen, uh, it's part, as part of the application process, I'm sorry I'm getting all out of order here, but that's all right. Uh, part of the application process we ask about their medical history and their conditions and their medications and so on. That's normal. And, uh, and then we have these volunteer clinicians who review that and say, hmm, this one here is a potential problem because this person could crash on you. They, I mean, they just had a stroke a month ago and blah, 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 blah. And so we're like, okay, we don't have to take everybody at the, same, at the moment that they ask. We like to, but... So we tell them, you probably ought to look at going to a, um, a residential program maybe or something else, okay. And then the other thing they do is when the blood work comes back, they look at that and say, okay, we need to talk to these people uh, about certain things. We have a group appointment and give all their results back and the, the clinician is present to interpret it and answer questions and so on. So anyway, all the medical part is done by the clinicians separate from the education and the natural treatments that we teach them to do on themselves. So um, we're trying our best 
to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, to, because the church has been already said, I think uh, Dr. Hess said it last night in his talk, uh, the, the, the risk management people are really kind of nervous, uh, and I don't mean that to be a criticism. Um, I do believe this. I do believe, don't you find it, just a little side here for a moment, but don't you find it ironic that the church is preaching a message that says that we are going to face an economic boycott and we're just going to sail right through it. We're going to work for God and give the loud cry in the middle of a boycott where we can't buy ourselves, and yet we're scared to death over finances right now. I don't know where the, where the conversion is going to come, but to my way of thinking, simple mind, we're going to have to get away from being scared to death over finances if we're going to crash through an economic boycott. But anyway, whatever. Yes, ma'am. Our churches aren't preparing us no. for what's coming. We, we prepare individually, right, every day and trust the Lord, but our churches are not preparing us. Yes. I, I, would, I think I understand and I agree with what I understand you'd be saying, that the churches are not having this experience and are not training us how. But I do and also agree with you that it's an individual thing, even if the church was showing us. But no, unfortunately, we right now, uh, I'm sure, that I believe Satan's behind it, but we've had a number of, of bad experiences where the church has been uh, found liable for a large amount of money for something that happened. Uh, I, I don't know that it's ever happened because of doing hydrotherapy and, and health education, but somehow it's carried over. They're, they're worried about that. You know, the ones that I'm familiar with have been uh, child abuse at a school or, or something like that. And that's, to me, that's, that's apples and oranges. We, you know, we're not, we're not even, the only, we're not doing anything. Like I said, the way we've got it now, we don't even draw blood on these people. Uh, we let LabCorp do it. And so, anyway, I just wanted to, I know this is an issue many times people have about doing any kind of, of health treatment programs in the church. And so uh, we're working in diligently to find ways to keep it so we can avoid that, that worry. Okay, and by the way, I want to say one other thing. Actually, you do not need to do anything medical to people who are not on medication. If the people that come to your program are taking no medication, they're not under medical care, you do not have to do anything that requires a doctor. The reason that you have to have a doctor involved if they're on medication, certain medicines, is those medications can be dangerous. They can reach dangerous levels if you put, give them a lifestyle change that reduces their condition, now they can be over-medicated, and that can be dangerous. So, uh, but anybody who's not taking medicine, or is taking, I mean, I don't know what would be, like if they're taking uh, levothyroxine or some kind of, you know, uh, even type 1 diabetics, they're on a medicine, but they know how to control it, and it's nothing, again, you don't have to, don't have to uh, have a doctor involved. I like to have a doctor involved because I like to show people the blood test changes so you got to have a doctor to order the blood test. Anyway, let me move on. Yeah, okay, so I was telling you about, so I'm going to now make a little transition, okay? And um, uh, let's see how, the, the, how this goes. I may have to turn some lights off. What will your last ten Sorry years here. Let me just pause that. Will you be quick? Oops, wrong way. I want, I want to get the sound up. I didn't see that on that controller a way to do it. Oh, yeah, look at that. That was way down. No wonder we couldn't hear it. All right, let's go again. Sorry, I'm going to, somehow the sound isn't where it should be. <laughs> uh, can, are you able to hear? You're not able to hear back there, are you? I can hear here. you. All right, well, my apologies then for stopping you. Let's just go ahead and, and do this. I'll back up just a little bit here. Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace 
every moment. Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. The average Canadian will spend their last 10 years in sickness. Change your future. Boy, aren't you glad we're not Canadian? So I want you to imagine, if you can, a diet that could induce beta cell neogenesis. In other words, that means could make new beta cells. A diet, a way of eating that could restore beta cell function in the pancreas, that could really make a uh, uh, cure, if you will, type 2 and type 1 diabetes. Well, you don't have to imagine it. This has been done in two different labs, in mice with some interesting parallels that they, uh, in the human pancreatic tissue that they studied. The studies have not been done in humans the same way they were done in mice because it required uh, killing the mice and dissecting their pancreas to prove that there were new beta cells. And most human beings are not ready to do that yet. Uh, but, so the first one was, and by the way, this is published in, I can't, my pointer won't work on this screen, but in Cell, that's like the premier medical journal for cell uh, research, okay? Uh, prestigious, very prestigious uh, paper. And so, uh, what does it say, the title? Fasting mimicking diet promotes that's an, that's an epigenetic factor. Uh, beta cell regeneration to reverse diabetes. Um, and so these fasting mimicking diet, it's a four day thing they did in the mice. Then they proved, again, with their dissection and their pathological studies, that, that it, the gene switches were changed in such a way that the cells that had been support cells were turned into beta cells. In fact, notice this, it was similar to what they, had, they have observed in pancreatic development. In other words, in the development of an embryo that's developing a pancreas organ, a similar kind of a process takes place from the result of what? Fasting. A diet. Yeah, a fasting mimicking diet. If, I mean, if someone had told me 20 years ago in medical school, oh, by the way, there's a diet that you can give your patients and restore them, make new beta cells out of this. This is crazy. You can, how can the eat food, how can a diet do that? I mean, it's still mar I still marvel that this is even possible. And it's, yes, we're not yet to the point of proving it's happening in humans, but there are definitely a lot of clinicians who are starting to use the fasting mimicking diet with diabetics, and we don't know that it's producing new beta cells, but what we do know is it's making amazing changes in their diabetes. So, sorry. Um, so, in, they looked at uh, type 1 diabetic uh, pancreatic islet cells uh, of humans and saw very similar uh, kind of changes. But they, again, it's still not, uh, it wasn't in a living person yet. Then there's another, okay, so here's what their conclusion is. A fasting mimicking diet promotes reprogramming of pancreatic cells to restore insulin generation in islets. Islets are the little bunches of, the beta cells are in little bunches called islets. In, from type 1 diabetic patients and reverse both type 1 and type 2 uh, phenotype physical characteristic in mouse models. Then here's the second one published uh, in uh, 2017 and also 2018. Same kind of thing was done here. Um, you're not going to spend a lot of time. By the way, I do have these slides all in a PDF. If you wanted them, um, you can just get your email to the program and our handouts will be available to give to you. So anyway, um, in humans, they have been doing research on this and that's what's described here. Day one of fasting mimicking uh, diet supplies about 1,100 calories and there they give the mix uh, how they, what the, the nutrients were. And days two to five, they drop the calories to 715 calories. Uh, and, and you can see the, the mix of nutrients is similar, just a bit more carbohydrate um, and less protein and, and uh, fat. So 
Yeah, there's the paper, the front page of the paper. This was published in Nutrition and Metabolism, not quite as prestigious as Cell, but a very respectable journal in uh, 2018. So uh, you saw this all over the front pages, right? Yeah, that, that was a, a sarcastic comment. Uh, yeah, it's interesting how, why is this not being shared? They should have told us everything you could possibly want to know about COVID. But drugs. do you know, I have a friend, a, a doctor friend out in California who, who has a lifestyle medicine practice. He uses a, his own version of a fasting memory diet and other things, and he is having great remission rates in diabetic patients. They put that on their web page that they can reverse diabetes, and in their great and wonderful wisdom, Facebook took it off and told them, you cannot say that, according to the experts, Diabetes is not reversible. We cannot allow you to put that on you. That's, that is disinformation. God help us. So anyway, then they say here, our study provided further evidence because, you know, this was the, the group that did the first study, Dr. Longo. Uh, so we've got this, uh, and it says here, notice what it says, we propose that the pattern of intermittent fasting is key. You, this does not happen if you go on a permanent or, or long fast. It's, it's the cycling, apparently, there's, it's a cycling process of, of low calorie, high nutrient, and then back to normal eating for a, a couple of weeks or whatever it is, the rest of the month. And then uh, you ha have another iteration. So each one of these studies used three iterations. Uh, all right, well, I'm going to jump ahead of this because we didn't need to. This is not a formal. Uh, continuing medical education. All right, so what we're talking about is if you're, the, the topic right now in these slides is about what's called epigenetics. It's about the switches on your genes, okay? So uh, they've actually discovered, and this was published in, uh, over a decade ago, that they could change the gene switches to reprogram fibroblast skin cells and turn them directly into heart cells. So they were able to, they've been able to discover the switches in mice skin cells that, that control the, the type of cell and turn it into a heart cell that was a functioning, working heart cell. So this is a picture of a skin cell and turn it into a cardiomyocyte. And as they report that they notice that top line fibroblast that were transplanted to mouse hearts the day after the gene switch changes, differentiated into cardiomyocyte-like cells. Okay, that's, um, is, you would not know they were not cardiomyocytes, but that's a safe way to say this, especially in the first research being published, because this was thought to be impossible, okay? It was thought to be impossible to create mature heart cells from a mature skin cell. We thought we had to use, do you know what kind? We thought we had to use stem cells. And that was what was the big deal. In fact, remember there was a big deal about getting these um, naive cells from uh, fetuses. And that created a stink because some people are very much opposed to uh, taking tissue from aborted babies or whatever. Um, and I'm not, this, don't misinterpret, I'm not pro, uh, pro doing that, all I'm saying is, I am a believer in this, and that is if my body uh, dies, or when it dies, uh, if the Lord doesn't come first, uh, I think I, will, uh, I expect to donate whatever is, is useful to anybody. That, uh, that's my approach, okay? I'm, I'm okay with them if they can use anything I've got that's still any good, but I know there are people who don't believe that you should do that. I respect the people. I don't go agree with their opinion. Here's another one. So that was looking at turning one cell into another. Look at this. So cell age, we're talking about here cell age, not about the age of the person or the body. So typical phenotypic aging, what we're talking about here is the, as a cell goes from a stem cell to a pluripotent cell to so on. It's what we call differentiation, okay? And every, every cell in our body has gone through that process until it became what it is. Um, and, that, and so that's, an, that's aging. You see. That's actually not the result of time. It's the result of epigenetic programming. 
And they say it overexpresses some genes and underexpresses others. So here they actually published a research on this showing here uh, as cells age, develop into their final form, these genes are expressed more and these are less, okay? And what's cool about this is now that we are learning how to find these switches, we can turn the age back on a cell. That's how they can turn mature cells into stem cells. And once you have a stem cell, you can, you know, we know that they can develop into whatever. One of the reasons that, that this direct reprogramming is so exciting is because these stem cells produced by reversing their age and then trying to get them to go in a certain direction has produced, un, unfortunately, a number of cancers and other problems. It's, you can't always, we're not very good at making the cell go where we want it to. But when they discovered how to turn it from one cell directly into the other, that's a real, a real boon. So now let me share with you a couple of case histories. You know, clinical people like to do that. So I'm going to show you a couple of case history, actual situations that I've worked with. Here is a picture from the a hotel in Marshall Islands, sometimes called the Pearl of the Pacific. Uh, and it was my terrible fate to have to spend um, some time there doing research. Uh, somebody had to do it. But anyway, and this was the view of the bay. Beautiful place and some very uh, friendly, kind people. I was there to do some research, uh, federally funded research, $2 million. Thank you for your tax dollars. Keep paying taxes. Um, and you'll probably recognize a couple of people here. Like, I don't know if you recognize him because he's so much younger and dressed for the tropics there. But on the far left, that's actually Dr. Wes Youngberg. Um, he was uh, in Guam at the time. And we took the team of Marshallese people that we were training to do lifestyle. See, I've been training people to do lifestyle a long time. And we took them to Guam where they could see the Adventist uh, uh, SDA clinic uh, New Start Center. And so then he came over with us uh, to Guam, I mean to uh, Majuro. So we're taking finger sticks, blood sugar. Uh, here, there's a very famous lady right here, uh, Brenda Davis, a dietitian that's uh, sometimes called the, the matriarch of veganism. She's written a lot of books, one of them on or a couple of them on diabetes reversal. By the way, do you recognize this? That's the compounding pharmacy. In lifestyle medicine, the kitchen is the compounding pharmacy. So they were compounding the treatment right there, uh, cooking. Uh, this right here is uh, worth mentioning, and that is we were not teaching the Marshallese to buy these expensive uh, exercise equipment. We were using these, this equipment to quantify their fitness changes, okay? But the, what we taught them to do for exercise was a very simple thing you can do with two feet, and it's called walking. This was the result of the very first group, uh, and this is the, you can see, 10 days. Uh, so the first two weeks, uh, we didn't count weekends. Um, they were on their own, kind of for the weekend. But this was the kind of blood sugars that they were having on the day one. I don't know if you know it or not, but you know, around 126 somewhere is, and above is considered diabetic, type 2 diabetes uh, on multiple readings. And so they were way up there, and after 10 days, they were still high, but not nearly that high. And they dropped 74 points is what that uh, regression equation shows. When I first showed this in Honolulu at a medical conference right after we had these results, the doctors in the audience were saying, so how did you do that? Did you?" Uh, use an insulin pump. Uh, somebody remind me, when are we finished? I've lost, hmm? 4.30? Oh, oh, one minute. Well, oh, that's right, he did say we had, so what do we have? 10 minutes? 10 minutes, okay, so we have 11 minutes. Oh boy, all right, like he said, listen fast. <laughs> I love that. Anyway, so uh, we didn't, there were two people in this group that were on insulin. We had to stop the insulin. We could, they, they were getting hypoglycemic uh, uh, because we were using something more powerful than insulin. Now, I know that sounds like heresy. And in fact, even some of you who are favorable to lifestyle medicine will think, well, Dr. John is obviously given to overexpression. I'm telling you not. Ask Dr. Tim Riesenberger, who was just in the previous sp speaker. In the ER, he's come, somebody comes in with high blood sugar. He does not give them a shot of insulin. 
he gets them walking in the, in the hallways and in the walking will lower their blood sugar as fast or faster than insulin and it does not have the risk of overshooting the mark and having to give them orange juice or some kind of something to bring their sugars up. So it, it's, it's effective. All right, this is a, a lifestyle medicine clinic that I uh, launched and worked uh, with in my hometown after I, I left uh, Loma Linda in, in 2006, came back home, and uh, I want to just show you this one. So here is a, a simulation uh, of an echocardiogram, okay? So this is a device that uses ultrasound, very similar to the way we use ultrasound to look at a fetus, okay? You can s visualize uh, living tissue and its motion. <laughs> and the reason is, that in heart disease, when there's an inadequate blood flow, it tends to cause a change in the way the heart beat happens, okay? It'll look, and when you have, I wish I had an, a one of a faulty circulation, but what will happen is part of the heart looks like it's limp, okay? So you can have one half of the heart sort of limp and the other one's working, and, and you know it's called hypokinetic, hypokinesis. All right, so this, story involves that. So here was a, uh, a gentleman that had uh, seen the cardiologist and he says after that we've reviewed everything here's our plan. We recommended he undergo coronary angiography with intervention if indicated which in plain English means they're going to do an angiogram they're going to put some dye in his, in his coronary arteries they're going to look for a blockage and if they find one uh, they're going to put a stent in there. Uh, well this uh, you can probably tell we share a name. This is my older brother. I have his permission to share this. Uh, and this was just after we left Loma Linda and got back. So he was, he was one of our early. But he had this study and, and he had some, clearly, some uh, blockage. Some, something wasn't working right in the heart. And so he came and spent two uh, months with us in our lifestyle program. Went through two, the ours were at that time a month long. He went through two of them and then he went and got another uh, cardiology report and this is what the, the cardiologist said the second time and this was all about two years after the other one the echo portion of the test is negative for ischemia patient done well with lifestyle changes he will continue with diet exercise and aspirin and the, I talked to Dr. Austin here and what he actually told me one on one he says you know I'm not so sure that he actually had uh, had heart disease, it might have been artifacts. In other words, that cardiologist looking at two different studies could not bring himself to believe it was possible to reverse that kind of disease. Uh, but it is possible and it's been documented much, by much better story, uh, research than what, uh, my just little anecdotal story. Uh, let me just show you this. So here is a study uh, done and uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine, 2009. This was a study published by surgeons who are doing bypass surgery, okay? It's, it's endoscopic versus open vein graft harvesting in coronary artery disease. So what they're doing is, you may or may not be aware of this, but when you have blocked arteries in your coronary artery tree, uh, they will take the vein out of, saphenous vein out of your leg and they will cut it to the right lengths and bypass those blocked areas. And if you have three of them is called three vessel bypass. If you have six of them, it's a six vessel bypass, okay? And so you have to be careful with that saphenous vein because you, you need all of it if you're gonna do five or six uh, vessel bypass. Well, anyway, what they had been, the surgeons have been discovering, it seemed that there was a difference in how long the graft would last, okay? So they looked at 12 to 18 month failure rate. How? long did it take for these graphs to plug up? And they had, it seemed that it differed based on how they took the vein out of your leg with open excision where they would basically cut all the way up to the knee and then a, or endoscopic, they would cut a few holes and put the device in there. And here's what the study showed, sure enough, the failure rate was 47% in 12 to, 14, 12 to 18 months with endoscopic, but only 38% with open excision. So, the, of course, the paper pointed out and recommended that they use open excision wherever possible to have a longer patency. So why in the world is a lifestyle medicine doctor like me, I would never do that surgery, I'm not qualified. Why am I interested in this article? Because the failure rate is 43 to 47 percent 
in 12 to 18 months. And if you would make lifestyle changes, if we could get a hold of that person, and they're motivated when this happens, we could make this last years. In fact, maybe we could reverse the need. Maybe we could reverse the blockages. So compare that to this. OK, maybe you've seen this picture. This is Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn's colleague who had such blockages. It, it looks like some places the, the highways you know, cut off. There's one lane of traffic here is what that means because there's so much atherosclerosis. After 32 months on a plant-based diet without medicine because he was allergic to statins, this is what the picture looked like. All four lanes open and going. So that's what can happen in 32 months. The other one, the blockages are 12 to 18 months, right? 40 some percent. I mean, it, it, the lack of a lifestyle medicine, of the use of lifestyle medicine is totally illogical, irrational. It is strictly, I think, money-based, but whatever it is, but it is changing. As I said earlier, fast growing. Every hospital, every uh, health system in the country practically now is getting on board with lifestyle medicine uh, practitioners. But every time I share this, like I'll show you the next few slides, I hear people say, I've just got bad genes. I mean, it's in both sides of my family. My brothers and sisters have had heart attacks, died early, blah, blah, blah. Well, we do inherit genes, but did you know there's something else we inherit from our parents? Cookbooks. Uh, remote control units. Anyway, habits. You know, um, apparently couch potatoism is contagious. Uh, anyways, there was a Time Magazine, whole issue in January 2010, the whole issue was about why your DNA is not your destiny. The new science of epigenetics does what? Reveals the choices we make can change our genes. Those of our kids now that sounds like an exaggeration. I'm going to stop when I get to, to that point. So quick review of history. This is the actual picture of Watson and Crick getting the Nobel Prize award for proving that deoxyribonucleic acid is the molecule of inheritance, OK? This is a picture of a younger picture of Dr. Francis Collins. He was director of the NIH during the COVID. He, he uh, retired. Uh, but he was the leader of the Human Genome Project, Three billion base pairs of human DNA uh, in every cell, OK? This is, by the way, what a base pair. This is like rungs on this twisted ladder. Every rung is a base pair. One, two, one, two. So there was how many billions? Three billion? Someone estimated, by the way, oh, there's over a trillion cells in your body. Estimated if you could, and this is in one cell, if you could take all of those, and they're about two meters long, that three billion, that it would reach to the moon and back. I don't know if that's true or not. OK, so I'm going to skip past the, some of this to get to this point, because we're running out of time. And that is, I want to, while you're looking at this old picture and, and figuring out what those are, um, I want to tell you how they came about. OK, mammals, uh, we have an ovum, an egg, if you will, from the mother, it is combines with a sperm from the father. OK, those, are, those cells can either die in a few hours or days if they don't merge. Their, light, their fate is either we have to get together and form a zygote, and then we can start working, because each one has only half of the, of the pair of 23 chromosomes. OK, so these little triplets here, they all obviously had success. The ovum and the sperm uh, combined made a zygote, and the zygote then can do one of two things. Either it can die or become two cells. So it became two cells. Each of those cells became two cells. And in the case of human beings, nine months later, approximately, we were born with trillions of cells. So here's my question. If every cell in your body came from the first cell, has the same DNA, then how is it that some of it produces different things, like an ear or a, a toe or a brain cell? Did you know that we have all the genes for a liver in our ear? Aren't you glad they're turned off? <laughs> in fact, you have all the genes for a left ear and your right ear. Every cell has all the genes for any cell. So that's why 
You could turn a skin cell into a heart cell if you turn on and off the right genes because that's what makes a cell what it is, is the expression of the genes. And so, I mean, this is an exciting area of science, but extremely complex. What they're saying is that the switches are orders of magnitude more complicated than the genes themselves. So what they did in the Human Genome Project was amazing, but we're doing a much more difficult task now. So, actually, this is Dr. Whitelaw, a recognized expert, so I can use her in, uh, in official uh, medical conferences and not just myself. But what she says is we don't inherit DNA. We inherit chromosomes, and chromosomes are only half DNA. The other half is actually these uh, proteins and, and molecules that control the expression of the genes. And now we've actually learned that a lot of the, what we used to call junk DNA, because it didn't have any genes, we, and it was stupid to call it junk, because now we're finding out that it's actually part of the switching mechanism. It's, yes, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make a protein, but it controls the expression of other, gene, of other parts of the DNA. So the, the Lord didn't make a big mistake and give us 98% of junk. It's complicated enough. I personally believe that he made it complicated enough that Lucifer would be limited in what he could do. We know he did do some amalgamation, we, it, we're told plainly that the briars on the roses and, and a variety of other things are the result of Satan's evil amalgamation. And we're told that if there was one sin above the other that called for the destruction of the antediluvian race, it was that of amalgamating man and beast. Uh, there's a lot of... So, and by the way, in case you didn't know it, science is again doing that. We are mixing the genes from species, cross-species, uh, etc., um, and so far, it does, the part that we know about, I say that with, with, with great significance, the part we know about doesn't seem to be that bad or dangerous. But I believe there's good evidence that not everything that's being done is being reported in the scientific literature. Okay, so I'm going to stop because it's about time to stop. And... and um, and I want to ask you a couple of questions. The part that I uh, want to, the reason I showed you this information is part one is so that I want you to see the science behind the power of simple things like diet, okay? We talked about the fasting mimicking diet. We talked about the epigenetic changes. What I didn't get a chance to show you uh, was the evidence for how the diet is the strongest effect on gene expression of anything that's been discovered yet. And this is a published in published papers. Diet has more global impact on the gene expression in your body than anything else we have discovered. Now, what I love about that is that is so harmonious with the Bible. I know we have a tendency and we're most many of us are comfortable that Adam and Eve uh, ate the forbidden fruit and it was an uh, act of disobedience and separated them from God and, and so all this stuff happened. Well, I want to suggest to you that Ellen White's writings and science is now indicating that there was actually, some of that was the product of eating that fruit. It was truly bad for them, the forbidden fruit. It wasn't just forbidden because God wanted to have this sort of arbitrary test. It was a, something that they should not eat. It was not good for them. And the reason I think that's important for us to understand is, listen, many people say, have you ever heard the saying, well, if it tastes good, I know it's, it's bad for me. And if it's good for me, I know it tastes bad. Uh, okay, so there's this mindset that if, if it's really good for you, it's, it's terrible. Well, so now my wife and I, I've got to be careful, I'm going to get too winded here, but my, this is true. My wife and I have had the privilege of running at least two different eating establishments for the general public. And in both cases, they were totally plant-based. Some people would call them vegan. If you really understand vegan, it's not vegan because I, I used to wear leather. I still wear leather belt, leather shoes. You can't do that if you're a real vegan, okay? You shouldn't even probably eat honey in many circles. So we weren't vegan. We were plant-based. And we loved the challenge. What our goal was, was that when people would come in from this part of the country where everybody eats beef and, and, and pork, uh, that they would love it. 
And that was what we aimed for, was healthy food that the non-Adventist, non-vegetarian would say, man, this is good stuff. We actually entered our, our vegan chili in the chili cook-off. We got third place, you know, give us a couple more years, we probably would have had, anyway. Uh, so you can make food that changes gene switches the right way and make it so people like it. And that is why I think Ellen White called the cook uh, 10 talents. A talent in, in cooking healthy food, she said, is 10 talents. Uh, so I wanted you to see the science for, for that, the powerful science. And um, the other thing I wanted to share was that you do not have to have um, a doctor to do an effective lifestyle program, but it is good if you can get one that will help you do the blood testing because the blood tests change dramatically. I know Miriam was in one of the programs, or was it the first one we did here at Village? And uh, she saw, not on your own self, but many people had amazing results. Uh, very similar to what I had showed you. Well, I need to honor the, uh, the instructions. I'm one minute late, I think. So let's close with prayer. And uh, again, if you let, uh, I'm going to make sure that uh, Pastor Dr. Mike Hess uh, says this uh, publicly, but I believe the understanding is that if I send my handouts in PDF form and you ask for them, then they'll be able to distribute to anybody that wants it. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Wow, how wonderfully and fearfully made we are. Thank you for giving us the ability to understand as much as we do, and though we still understand so little. I ask that you will bless, bless us in the remainder of this conference and this meeting, but also I ask that you'll bless each one of us as we seek to do medical missionary work, medical evangelism, for this world. Oh Lord, help us, keep us safe as we seek to work these large cities where the devil is doing so many uh, evil things. I believe you are more than able to take care of us. And so send us forth with your Holy Spirit power, I pray in Christ's name, amen. Thank you very much.